Everybody, how you doing? Well, that's good. You're listening to PHL Live Flyers presented by Mortgage CS. Check out mortgagecs.com slash PHLY to start your home buying process today. Company NMLS ID number 1464766. Let's get a couple more victory woos for the official winning streak. Woo! 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 That's three in a row for our Philadelphia Flyers coming out of the all-star break. As I put my hat back on, that makes it uh, by the rules of Major League Two and Lou Brown officially a winning streak. They have these three, and it's been pretty good. It's been some pretty good hockey coming out of this All-Star break. Okay, I am Bill Match, your director of Fun and Games for the evening. Joining me tonight, the one and only Jay P. Feeling? Zapata. Charlie O'Connor will be along in a little bit, and we'll uh, we'll see how long he lasts based on his <laughs> mic quality. But you all know how it goes at this point. The post games are always a test of Charlie's ability to troubleshoot issues. At least entertaining. So yeah, it is <laughs> really like you, you do like 82 of these, you know, uh, you got to keep it a little interesting. Flyers kept it interesting tonight. They, uh, they end up winning three two. the Scott mm-hmm. Lawton empty netter at the, uh, at the end does not count it was after the buzzer significant to some as al michaels would say uh but they, they win the game three to two they beat uh dave hackstall seattle kraken always huge it is a i just i hate losing to him <laughs> there i think seattle was three one and one against the flyers uh since they've come into the league and i just that guy i, I mean like it was the beginning of my real like podcast career Real like along like watching along with Dave Hackstall. That was your first just, coaching tenure. It was just the worst. It was the worst shit ever. Uh, watching those teams, and it's all it always feels good to beat him. But I guess we'll start tonight uh, discussing the goaltending. Cal so, Peterson gets the start. I wondered how much Cal Peterson would play, given the schedule. They don't have a ton of back to backs. They don't have a back to back until. Uh, February 24th, 25th, they only have a few for the rest of the season. All the back-to-backs, not all of them are like three and fours. So you can really like spread it out right. and kind of – you didn't have to go to Cal Peterson a ton mm-hmm. down in these final 30, 32 games after the, uh, after the All-Star break. They go to him tonight in the third game, and he was pretty decent. He was. Uh, the Flyers played pretty well defensively. I think they only ended up giving up, what, 20 shots? It was like, yeah, 19 shots 19 here, shots 17 on goal. saves for Cal Peterson. Yeah, so he, he's okay enough. Uh, they, he plays well enough for the team to win. I got to say, in, considering it's his first NHL start since December, uh, he did or since November, excuse me, he did play the final two periods of the Boston game before mm-hmm. the break, so it's not like he hasn't had any time, uh, but they pulled uh, – they ended up pulling Arison for the final two periods of that game. But yeah. really he has not seen NHL pucks in a while other yeah. than, other than that. And I thought he was decent tonight. Yeah. What they say was his first start since November since 11th, November 11th or 13th, something yeah. like that. So this, before we got back into the play from the break, we talked about it. This was an important situation that we needed to analyze because with March 8th looming, you wanted to know what exactly you were going to have as far as your backup Golden or not that, because obviously we're all looking to see Ayers take over the, the number one spot, take a full grasp of it. But we wanted to see, yes, because you're not going to rely on Ayers every single game. We've seen some bad from Cal Peterson before, but tonight, look, the defense in front of him, the guys in front of him did a really good job. I mean, the amount of blocks I saw, that's something I want to ask Charlie, is talk to Charlie about as well. Oh, and Tippin making big, big blocks. I would uh, love Palin that with the a end. huge yeah. block. A lot of guys. So it was a really good effort in front of him. And in the second period, there was a couple opportunities where you had to rely on Cal Peterson. But overall, 
I thought he was solid, and you did a good job of keeping him clean. You did. I think the most important thing is the defense they played in front of him. I thought maybe midway through the second, they kind of started to lag a little bit, but they did get a little momentum back. Yeah. At the end of the third, they at least won some shifts. Seattle ties the game first 36 seconds, and it's like, ah, oh, shit. Like, are they... How's this going to go? But the third period, it's not like they were under a ton of duress. It's not like it was a shooting gallery the yeah. way the uh, the way the final forty minutes of the last game went. So that was really good to see out of this Bill, team. Bill, there was there was some droughts throughout the game for Seattle. I think like they mentioned it near the end of the third period, it was like almost fourteen minutes where Seattle didn't even take a shot. The beginning of the second <laughs> period, the first nine minutes they take a shot. That was their shot total after the first period. Seattle's was ten. And we were both like watching and it, it's on 10. It's over halfway through. And then they come back from a commercial break and suddenly they have 11. And we're both <laughs> like, when they get this one Where shot, come from? They, they did hit the post once. But it was like, when, at what point did they, but it, it all ends up pretty good. And we, it's just hard to know what you're going to get out of Cal Peterson. Like right. he made nine starts in the AH or in the NHL last year. Mm -hmm. He'd made two this season. Mm -hmm. Numbers haven't been great over the last uh really three seasons so you just don't know what to expect out of him but for right now i think it's a it's a good sign if you want this team to make the playoffs because i seriously doubt they were going to do anything to upgrade the position uh for one they're paying cal peterson five million bucks <laughs> like I know he's spent most of the year in the AHL and it's just kind of sunk cost. You're spending that money because you wanted to take some stuff back from the Kings so that you could get something from pro for Proveroff. Right. You got the return you wanted and that's good, but like you did very badly need uh, like you, you just very badly don't want to spend any more on this backup position. Cause you're already, yes, you get some salary relief for Carter Hart, but five million bucks for your backup is a ton of money, yeah. especially for one. Now he's made three starts. Yeah. <laughs> his minutes, his dollars per minute is absolutely insane right now. I doubt they were going to upgrade the position. Maybe after the deadline, you see what kind of cap space you have. You make a waiver claim or something, Yeah, but you kind of just need Cal Peterson to be at least. Okay. Yeah. And the few games he's going to play, if you want this team to make a playoff push, he needs to not suck. Yeah. He didn't <laughs> suck tonight, and they win because of it. That's huge for them right now. Just be an NHL goalie. That's really what you're asking for. Like, just be. I'm not asking for the world here. I Don't need you to not like suck. <laughs> yeah, no, that's literally everything that you're asking for. And, yeah, we like we talked about before, like, you don't want to give up assets. Like, I know we're winning, but... There is still there. We are still building for the future. So we are still trying to gain those assets. So, yes, Cal Peterson looking like a functional NHL goaltender is is good news. That's a huge positive. Yeah. And so and he's building confidence, which is important here because a, a performance like tonight has to build his confidence. Now, that's uh, it's such a mental game with goalies. You never sure. actually know what to expect. That's why like you need elite goaltending to win a cup. Unless you're like Colorado a couple years ago. <laughs> you need your goalie to play at an elite level, but it's rarely the actually elite goalies who do it. It's just dudes who get hot for a little while, and that is not what I'm expecting out of Cal Peterson, but it just shows you how important the confidence aspect is. And I don't think if he gets 10 of the final, what now, 29 games, I will be shocked by that. I think it's going to be, for the most part, Sam Harrison. But yeah. now this does give you the opportunity, at least for now, you know, he could have, he, he could suck next time out. But right now, if I'm the coach, I'm thinking, I don't have to run Sam Harrison into the ground. I can still have a, like, t normal starting schedule for him and not an over-the-top, like, oh, yeah, we got to run him out there as much as, like, the Devils ran out bro door because that's what we need to do if we're going to make the playoffs. Right. I still expect him to see a, to see a lot of Harrison, but at least for now... Cal Peterson looks like a dude that you can put out on the ice and he's not going to cost you the game. Yeah. Are you a little shocked? Cause like I figured that they would want to put him out there Monday against Arizona, but it, it worked out well here tonight. You know, it's a really interesting. Yeah. Like maybe just the I, right now, I guess it's just, you kind of want to keep Harrison on some sort of normal schedule. Like, okay, you're going to start two out That's of important. Three. We're going to, especially with no back-to-backs until the, you know, until like two weeks from now, basically. Mm -hmm. um, 
uh, three in a row. I mean, he can start three in a row. It's not the end of the world. But it's like, okay, we're going to give you two out of every three, and we're going to keep that schedule going through the month, and then we'll see how March goes, and then maybe you start everyone in April. Like, who knows? If we're that close, like you kind of keep him on a normal schedule so that if you have to go all him for those final seven games or whatever in April, you do it. I, It's going to be a tight rope to walk. Like, it's... It's a 24-year-old goalie that you have no idea about. I mean, you have a rough idea of what he is, but again, it's goaltending. It's voodoo. And then you have this veteran, this overpaid veteran who you got as a cap dump, who is now your backup as your, you can say you're rebuilding all you want. They want to make the playoffs. Like, you can't be this close to it and think, eh, if we don't, we don't. Like, I I know it's got to be the overall sentiment because this is all house money. They never expected, at least no one on the outside expected him to be here this year. But you're there now. Yeah. Like, there's under 30 games left. You got to be a little excited about the possibility. Like, Danny Briere, first year on the job, like, yeah, did pretty well, huh? (laughs) You know? (laughs) Last year's second leading scorer gone, the number one defenseman gone. You lose your goalie halfway through the season. Like, Things are looking pretty good. Looking pretty like, good. Uh, so I'm 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 excited about we, what we saw out of Cal Peterson because at least for right now I can talk myself into could be worse. Yeah. Could be worse down the stretch for a team that I want to see play in the playoffs. For those who are looking ahead at the schedule with the goalie, so the end of the end of February is one you're probably going to want to rely on Arison. So you got the Rangers on the 24th. Now, Pittsburgh, obviously not the same team, but you're going to be in Pittsburgh on the 25th, and then you got Tampa on the 27th. So those are going to be three games you may want to rely on, Harrison. So it's interesting how February is going to play out here with the goalies. Uh, it, it absolutely will be. Uh, another guy I want to talk about, you know, it was actually it was actually funny. I was saying to Brenna as we're watching Sean Couturier score the, uh, the winning goal tonight, <laughs> I'm like typing up, I'm like looking up Sean Couturier's game logs. I'm like typing up, tonight's topic on coots and it's like man just has not been great lately and that uh the game tying goal for seattle 36 seconds into the second period 39 whatever it was yeah it's it's not all on coots but he overplays the puck in the defensive zone totally whiffs and then reaching for a poke check it gets deflected and then peterson can't track it down, and suddenly we have a tie game that the Flyers had mostly controlled for a lot of the first 40 minutes, and suddenly it's, okay, well, now we're not even playing with the lead in the third. They get it back, and they get it back on a pretty nice play by Sean Couturier. Yeah. He wins the faceoff straight back, goes to the net, gets the tip. Flyers are up 3-2. Last seven games for Coots, though, no goals, one assist. I think this was his first goal in 11 games. He very badly needed this. Yeah. And I'm just hoping this is the start of something for him. Yeah. He hasn't looked great lately. Uh, He's been, I I wouldn't say he's been bad, but they need more out of the guy who is their highest paid player, their number one center, a former Selkie Trophy winner. Yes, Travis Konechny is their best player. If Sean Couturier isn't number two or at worst number three, things aren't going to go well. He got back on track tonight, at least in the third period. Yeah, that, that was the important part there. You know, I, I was telling you as well, this was a, Coots' 11th goal of the season, and I was completely shocked by that because we, we these hasn't been terrible throughout the entire There was that one spurt where he was scoring consistently, and so that's why I was like, really? 11 goals? All right, well, that, that's kind of where we're at with Coots. But, no, we've talked about before that when Coots is on, he lo- is looking like that Selkie nom- nominee there. This team is co- is competing with some of the best in Eastern Conference. So if this team wants to, you know, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna toot some horns here, but if this team wants to g- make a little bit of a run, it, Coots would have to be the guy to step up and be that guy again. But it, for right now, I would like the fact that he got this goal, get that confidence back up, and hopefully this starts something for for Coots because we know when he's on, the rest of the team is on as well. He is, and he's never been like an offensive driver. You know, he was, he is great at getting your team out of the defensive zone and into the offensive zone. And when he first started playing with Claude Giroux, it was like, all right, well, now guess what? You have a great playmaker who can hit you with the puck and it'll go in the net. Is basically how he ended up scoring 30 goals. We've seen him kind of take a back seat offensively this season. He's been banged up at points. He's missed a game here or there. It's not like he's missed extended periods of time. But you just want to see him find some consistency. And that's what I want to ask Charlie about 
uh, when he does join us because it's not even about what we're seeing out of Couturier this year. It's what you're projecting for him going forward. Yeah. The guy has a basically full no-move clause, I believe, through the end of his contract, which is like six more years or whatever it is. And he's your highest paid player right now. Now, in a couple of years when the cap goes up, that 775 isn't going to be a huge albatross. But you are going to need him to be pretty good still. Yeah. It's not like he can just disappear and say, oh, well, you know, everything's fine still. No, he's still going to be making a good chunk of money. You need this guy to not just be good this year, but maintain that level going forward. Maybe find a little bit more. For our confidence in him, I'm hoping that this final 29 games now is, all right, this is what we're going to get out of. This is what we're going to get out of Sean Couturier, and he's going to be one of the catalysts for a team making a run to the playoffs. Yeah, yeah. So it's it's going to be fun to see what Coots and the rest of the veteran players can do as well. Uh, we've talked about Cam Atkinson too, but for especially for Sean Couturier, I, I, he, for me, like he's the tone setter, especially on both. He's he's one of the few centers that plays both both ways, so he's truly important for this team, especially going forward, man. Uh, let me take a quick second to tell you about our first partner tonight. It is Bagels and Company, the absolute best Brooklyn-style bagels made right here with full Philly love. Uh, first thing you got to know about Bagels and Company, huge variety, 15 to 20 different types of bagels to choose from daily. I see Kelly Hinkle in the chat right now. Kelly paid a visit to her local Bagels and Co. recently. Uh, not only do they have, like, you know, your, your general stuff, your everything bagels, your plain bagels. They have maybe a wheat everything, something a little different. And then way out of left field, how about, how do you like a Dorito bagel? You know, <laughs> how do you like a little that uh, Dorito dust on there? They, pretty good. They, it really does. Honestly, I can see myself ordering that at some point. <laughs> uh, so just a huge variety of bagels. And when you have that many bagels on tap, you got to have a ton of cream cheeses, 30 different varieties of cream cheeses and schmears available daily. And yeah, this is all well and good. You're here. Okay. Lots of bagels, lots of cream cheese. I've had the coffee. It's actually delicious. You're going to want to get yourself a coffee at Bagels & Co. Whenever they drop it off here, I put away like half of it. Uh, I have a caffeine problem, as you can probably tell by my constant drinking of caffeine on this show. They, they satiate that need for me. Finally, though, most importantly, it's an affordable brand. Lots of food for cheap. What else can you ask for? So for the best Brooklyn-style bagels made right here in Philly, head to thebagelsandco.com slash store dash locator for, to find the closest bagels and company near you. Uh, someone I wanted to talk about tonight I thought had a really strong first period, scored the shorthanded goal, second shorthanded goal in as many games. It is Ryan Palin. He's kind of been one of their go-to guys over the last uh, – List really since coming out of the break, but he yep. played uh, 21 minutes in Boston as well. What did he end up with tonight? Paling back down to 15 minutes and 12 seconds. So not among the team leaders as he has been the last few games. Uh, he played 1846, second most among the forwards uh, against Florida. Played the third most amongst the forwards over 18 minutes again against the Jets. He led the forwards at ice time against Boston before the break over 21 minutes. They have been leaning heavily on Ryan Paling. Not as much tonight, but he made his presence felt with the shorthanded goal. I am just very, very interested to see where they really slot him in going forward. Because he seems to be the perfect fourth liner. But... John Tortorella has seen more out of him lately and said as much the other day in the media, uh, in his media availability, that Paling hasn't shown him enough to stay consistently okay. in the top nine, in the top six forwards, but he's shown him enough to get those chances now and then. You're seeing that right now. I like what, watching Ryan Paling play. He looks to me like, again, the perfect fourth liner, whether he has more... He's kind of aging into the point where he is what he is. But a guy who can score like this for you on the penalty kill, who can give you these important defensive minutes, who can play center, skate like he can, he is an underrated signing that Danny Briere made this offseason. It's crazy. Like he, I bunch him, Garnet Hathaway, Sean Walker, the Freegis that we brought here, because the way that they have responded, they've really embraced playing here and just Tortorella's tutelage as well. But... 
You, we mentioned Paling earlier with the block shots. He's so big on both ends. The PK is so important, and he he it's crazy. He's got his second straight game with a shorthanded goal. But it, it, it's it's a, it's the the ability that he has to will to buy into towards the system. It's been so important here, and the fact that these guys have been able to buy in in such a short time. It's it's been so important here, Bill. And it's it goes to show that going forward. All these these players are coming. It's coming into they're coming into a good culture, and I think that what pa that's what Palin has been 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 able to benefit from. And uh, it, I actually found it a little interesting today that you get the first period goals out of not only Ryan Paling but the guy we've said Paling kind of makes a little redundant in Scott Lawton. We keep hearing more and more about Scott Lawton's apparent availability at the uh, at the trade deadline. I wondered a couple of weeks ago, like I don't know if. If they didn't want to move him for a first-round pick over the summer, a few years ago they had trade offers for Scott Lawton and decided, yeah. okay, well, if he doesn't sign his extension, we'll trade him. And he signed, and he's been here ever since. They've had opportunities in the past, different regimes. Two different regimes have had the opportunity to trade him. He's still here. Scores the power play goal tonight, and it was a nice one. A uh, nice one-timer, just puts it right past Joey Decord, who played pretty damn well for Seattle he tonight. Did. He's having a great season for them. But I just, I wonder if this is finally it. Like, I'm skeptical that they actually want to trade Scott Lawton, but as you're seeing some centers come off the board, you're seeing what teams are really interested in. Like, I'm listening to uh, 32 Thoughts today, and it's, well, what does, uh, what does Edmonton want? They really want some forward depth, and they really want a right-handed defenseman. Well, the Flyers have Sean Walker and Scott Lawton. It's like, uh, there might be a match here. Let's might talk be Edmonton. A little, might be a little bit of a match here uh, for them to be able to make some uh, something of that. But just watching Scott Lawton, you see why teams like him. He plays his ass off. He plays all phases of the game now. Scores on the power play tonight. First power play goal of the season. But he has the tools to be a really good depth forward for you. I hope... Now, at this point, they're able to trade Scott Lawton because at some point, you're going to need to open up some roster spots. And with the emergence of Ryan Paling, yeah, I, I don't know if you can move Ryan Paling up in the lineup as much as they like to with Lawton when he's going well. Yeah. But for his usual role, I like Paling better. No, that, that is 100% true. I mean, I made the joke here today as well. Like, Lawton's definitely helped his trade value here today, but... It, it, with Lawton, it's really been like a mental thing. You, we talked about some of the penalties he's been committing. It's like, what are you thinking? It's not typical Scotty Lawton either. And so today just really felt like he got his confidence back. And that was definitely cool to see. And you could truly tell with that first goal in the power play. And if you can, if we can get that from Lawton, I mean, teams are going to need someone like Scott Lawton. So oh, that's one piece I would definitely, I hate to say, but I would like to see him move on because it's it's a piece that makes sense to move on with it today. No, that's, I like Scott Lawton a lot. He's right. been a really good role player for this team for several years. But it's been a long time. <laughs> he's been here a really long time. And Feels like it's he's got to be like, as much as I like him and what he brings to the lineup, he's not irreplaceable. Like, this is not a dude that you go, well, where the hell else can we find what he does? <laughs> You can find it a lot of places, and you can probably find it for a lot cheaper than $3 million. It's on the roster right now. Like, yeah, exactly. When you have, okay, we can actually look at a guy and go, he does what Scott Lawton does. He plays center. He's probably a more effective center than Scott Lawton is. Lawton plays center, but really, he's, he's a good winger, you know? And I just, I think now is finally the time where you have to do it. I, 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 like, if he, gets, if he gets a little hot and starts scoring a bit, uh, closer to the pace he was scoring at last season. I don't know how much it actually raises its value. Like the guy's almost 30 years old. Teams know what he is. Yeah. Like it, it's, oh, well, he's scoring now. Uh, but also you get, okay, well, he's scoring now. We're getting him while he's hot. Cool. Like maybe he can keep it up for the rest of his, who's to say? But I really just think the time is right. And I appreciate his leadership. I know a lot of guys look at him and he's one of the main pieces in this locker room. It's why... You know, we look at this roster and go, they don't have the talent. Yeah. They're in the playoffs, though. It looks like they have a really good chance to make it. Yeah. His the his leadership, whatever you want to call it, whatever his you know intangible is, it's one of the reasons then you have to chalk up to them being in this. 
but is he even going to be here when they're good again? You know, like yeah. someone else has to step up and take that role. If his leadership is that important, like someone else has to fill that void. Yeah, it is also very telling because, you know, we talked with Charlie last time about, you know, he's, he obviously hears the rumors. And yet he came out here today and he looked like he was filled with confidence. And we haven't seen a, a lot like this in a while. So we'll see what the, the rest of this, this uh, the rest of these couple of weeks play out before the deadline. But it does feel like. Uh, lots of time may come to an end and there's a team out there that could use a guy like you know cmc saying in the in the comment section he would fit perfectly for some of these cup contenders on that fourth line no that's exactly what he is he's a fourth line guy on a cup team and you can in a pinch move him up in the lineup like mm -hmm. we have seen him have success higher yep. up in the lineup now is it should if he's on a second or third line of yours no you're probably not a seer you're probably not deep enough you know, you're the Flyers of the last year. <laughs> yeah, exactly. When he's on last year's second line, it's like, yeah, that's why they picked seventh. You know, <laughs> like this is a clear indication of where you are. But if you have him slotted into that role where it's actually, you know, he's maybe closer to a third liner than a fourth liner. And we have him on our fourth line. That means you have enough depth to compete with some of these really, really deep teams. Like you're talking about going out west with him, maybe to Edmonton seems like a good fit. You have to compete with Vegas. You yeah. know, the deepest forward group in the league. You have to, and Toronto, looking at the same thing. Like, what are we, what are we missing? Yeah. We're missing that playoff attitude. That's what Scott Lawton brings. You're looking at that. His intangibles plus what he actually brings on the ice makes him someone I think you can get more for, even if it's not the first round pick we thought we could get for him this summer. Someone you can get more for than their actual value. Yeah. All right, and uh, speaking of actual value, the guy who has a ton joining us right now, it is Philadelphia's number one hockey beat reporter, Charlie O'Connor. Chuck, how are you tonight? Doing good. How are you doing, guys? Oh, outstanding. I celebrate every time we can hear you, even though it, it's like it's been a good amount of time that you've connected right away. It's still very exciting to me. Uh, first thing I want to ask you about tonight, Charlie, it's Cal Peterson, first start since November. Now, he did play against Boston before the break, came in for those final two periods, but, you know, he hasn't, like, been the guy for a while, has played some in the AHL, has been up and down. What would you think about Cal's play tonight? I thought he was solid. I, I thought that the – I guess it would have been maybe, like, the first 12 or 13 minutes of the second period, the Flyers didn't really control the play. I don't think they got destroyed, but I thought they were getting outplayed. They didn't start to finish dominate this game like they have some other games. But during that stretch, I thought Cal Peterson really stepped up. I thought he made some some big stops. Nothing that was highlight real amazing. But quite frankly, my expectations for Cal Peterson going to this game were pretty low. So even just him being fine in this game. And that game tying goal, that was pretty fluky. You know, it bounced off a of Sean Couturier's stick. I'm not going to give him too much grief for that one. And the, the one goal might have been offsides. It was very, very close. But even then, there was a ton of traffic in front. So that's a goal where maybe you hope he can stop it. But again, I'm not going to kill him for it. I think more or less in this game, he did exactly what you want a backup goalie to do. He made all the saves he should have made. And the Flyers control play well enough over the course of 60 minutes that making simply all the saves he should have made was enough for them to win this game. And that's all you can really hope for for someone like Cal Peterson, especially somebody who in the AHL has a legitimately awful save percentage. So I think it was reasonable to go into this game thinking, man, this could be this could be trouble. Cal Peterson just he simply played well. I don't think he was amazing, but he simply played well. And that was enough. That's the all I'm asking for from Cal Peterson is don't suck. Like, I need you to not cost the team games. You're not going to play a ton. I just need you to not cost the team games and that be the reason the Flyers missed the playoffs. So I thought it was a it was a good building block for Peterson tonight. Uh, you talked about that second goal being a little fluky. What the hell happened to Sean Couturier on that play, Charlie? He just, he looked like not himself. Uh, he does come back, score the, uh, score the go-ahead goal, makes up for it. Uh, how, what have you thought of, uh, of Coots lately, and do you think this is something he can build on, uh, getting a little offense for the first time in a while tonight? Yeah, I, I would hope he can build on it from a from an offense standpoint, definitely. I just think he had a an underwhelming game through most of the first two and a couple minutes of the third period. I think it just, that's, that's all it boils down to. Uh, there was a funny little anecdote. So we interviewed Katuri after the game, obviously. He scored the game winner. 
And Couturier said that after that second goal or the the third, yeah, the second goal that that uh, Seattle scored, the one where he kind of overshot the puck and then it goes off his stick and then uh, Torts gave him an earful. He really he really laid into him. And uh, and then Couturier obviously scores the game winner. So we asked Torts about it and Torts basically said, oh, yeah, I gave him the earful. And then after he scores the goal, he's got that energy. And he's like, yeah, that was definitely an F you directed at me. And then he literally gives like the middle finger in the press conference. <laughs> um, <laughs> and uh, and he says, but I love that. You know, I, I love that kind of energy. I love the fact that he wanted to do that to spite me. And he called him a crusty old pro. And one thing that he said that was really interesting, which I 100 percent agree with when it comes to Sean Gouturier, John Ritterella said, we are not a good enough, a good enough team to win games when Sean Couturier is just average. We need Sean Couturier to be really good if we're going to win games. And I think that was why he felt like he had to push Sean Couturier because this isn't a team where Sean Couturier can just be decent and the Flyers beat teams. They need Sean Couturier to play like one of their best players pretty much every night. We saw what happens when he does it. They lose five straight games going into the break. And it was really interesting, that kind of self-awareness from John Tortorella, that he knows that they need Sean Couturier to be really good if they're going to win. Hey, Charlie, what's going on? It's JP over here. I wanted to talk. Let's we'll see if this guy makes your three stars later here. But with less than a month, Scott Lawton looked pretty good here tonight. A goal with four shots. What did, what did you think of Scott Lawton here tonight, Charlie? Well, if you're talking about an FU performance, I, I think this was an FU performance from Scott Lawton. <laughs> I think he is. I mean, I interviewed him this week. He's very aware of the trade talk. He very much does not want to leave Philadelphia. I wrote about it in my article on a late Thursday night, early Friday. He wants to be a flyer for life. This is a guy who loves it here. He he was open with me. He's like, look, my my wife works here. You know, this is this is our home. He doesn't want to leave. He also knows he doesn't have trade protection. He knows that he's a guy. And he said, look, the one good thing about getting traded is that, you know, you're getting traded to a good team that wants you. So that would be cool. But he wants to be here. And I think what you saw in that first period with that goal, because he was flying around even before that goal. He gets the breakaway that uh, that draws the penalty essentially right before the power play. This is a guy who came into this game wanting to send a message. And I think that message was, I want to play so well that it's not like a lot of people joked about him increasing his trade value. I don't think that's going through Scott Lawton's mind. What's going through Scott Lawton's mind is, I want to play so well that you guys think you can't afford to trade me that I need to be a part of this, and you can't just give me away for a first-round pick because I am just too impactful. He obviously hasn't been that guy this year. He hasn't been very good by his own admission, but I think he does have that gear. I don't think he's cooked. I think he can get back to where he was, and he believes that too. And I thought in the first period especially, but really over the course of the entire game, I thought he played with the kind of jump that makes him an effective player. I actually felt kind of bad for him that he was stuck on a line in the first period with Nick Delorier, who I thought was terrible with the puck in this game it just seemed like Lawton was making these plays he would pass the puck to Deloria and Deloria wouldn't know what to do with it luckily they pretty much bench Couturier the rest of their got Couturier uh, Deloria the rest of the game gave Lawton better shifts better better line mates but no Lawton was great and I think Lawton's just trying to send the message to everybody that he doesn't want to go anywhere Charlie uh, I just have to you know we're talking about sending messages and the FU performances uh, maybe directed at the coach when when you see seattle on the other side and it's dave hackstall do you just remember the bad times and think man it is so much fun covering john tortorella <laughs> well our, our good pal kurt from broad street hockey had some real good tweets tonight he did some real good dave hackstall memes he was in rare form tonight so that was mostly look I, I would say that I didn't have a bad relationship with Dave Haxel. Dave Haxel just didn't give anybody anything. He was he was very guarded. He didn't give good quotes. He really didn't give much information at all. John Tortorella is the opposite of that. John Tortorella will be more combative than Dave Haxel, without a doubt, but he'll give you a hell of a lot more. You'll learn a lot more about how he views the team, about how he views players. And, uh, and yeah, we've got the national anthem going on in the background. Sorry. And a bunch of, <laughs> what is yeah, going on here? No, I, I, what? I, I true, I truly do not know why they are playing the national anthem for a beer league game, but they are. 
<laughs> that's awesome. <laughs> Honestly, that's awesome. Uh, good for you. Good for you, 40-year-old still living, living the dream. Uh, no, I just... Uh, hell of a wakeboarder, Dave Haxtell was. I'll give him that. Uh, don't know about there his coaching go. ability. Another uh, another bottom of the lineup guy who scored tonight, Charlie. We had Ryan Paling getting a second shorthanded goal in as many games. We've talked a little about how maybe his emergence and resigning makes Lawton more tradable uh, than he was thought of maybe a year or two ago. But I'm liking what I'm seeing out of him. His ice time normalized a little bit tonight didn't play like a team leading number as he has the last three games, but are you starting to see maybe there's more with paling or is it just a little hot streak with him? I, I you know, two shorthanded goals in two games is pretty darn good. I think this is always going to be his role though, is to be a shorthanded weapon. He brings the speed to the table. Uh, I do like that whole no look shot that, that he pulled off. That was uh, that was slick. Uh, well done for Ryan Palin. I honestly, I thought the same thing when he scored that goal, though, about Lawton, where Lawton had had the really good first period. He was rolling. And you're like, eh, maybe they will keep him. And then Ryan Palin scores. And you remember, you know, they might have cheaper, younger Scott Lawton on this roster already. And that's one of the reasons why they're probably strongly considering taking an offer for Lawton. Lawton, I'm look. Lawton loves Ryan Paling as a person. It seems like they're, you know, he has a lot of respect for him. He thinks he's a really good dude. But I'm sure there's a little bit of, you know, he doesn't want to be replaced by the younger player, even though that very well might be happening. Look, Paling looks like a useful player. I don't think it's a bad contract. I like the fact that he's part of this team. I love the speed that he brings because for how long, Bill, were we talking about the fact this team needed to get faster? <laughs> it has very quickly gotten significantly faster. And Ryan Paling is a non-insignificant part of that. And I'm glad he's sticking around. Now, what that means for Scott Lawton, I guess we'll see. But everybody can look at a depth chart. Everybody can look at a lineup and see that the two of them play similar roles. One guy is younger. One guy is cheaper. We'll see how it plays out. Uh, Charlie, let's, I want to stay on kind of potential Scott Lawton trade here with the deadline coming up. So obviously tonight we did play with 12 forwards. Um, go looking forward here uh, with the with the forward depth. What could what could you for predicting the future here a little bit? What could the Flyers be looking at bringing in a young forward, or what could potentially happen with the forward depth going forward? Do you mean like at the deadline or soon? Just in these next couple of weeks, yeah, leading up to the deadline. It's maybe possible. in a hockey trade. Yeah, I, I mean, look, if, for example, if Morgan Frost were to get traded, I believe that would be in a hockey trade. I think that would be swapping a player for a player or something like that. I don't think they're going to trade Morgan Frost away, you know, for a, a third round pick or even a second round pick or something. I think they would envision him as being part of some type of hockey move. Now, could I see them, you know, if it let me put it this way, like, let's say they're trying to get the most they can for Sean Walker and no one is willing to offer a first round pick, but someone is willing to offer a player that the flyers value with a first round pick, like that they think that he is equivalent value. He's a younger guy under 25, something like that. Could I see that player being the centerpiece of a Sean Walker deal? Sure. I don't think the flyers are looking at it that they, they need another young forward. I also don't think they're shutting the door because you always are looking for good young forwards. If you think they can fit your timeline and, that he could, a player like that could, but I am not of the opinion that I think the Flyers should be going out trying to buy. I don't think the Flyers are of that opinion. If the way a trade shakes out, the way you can get the most value for one of their rentals is to bring back another 25 forward, I would be very much in favor of that. Like some people have brought up the idea of like Nick Robertson on Toronto. You know, he's mm -hmm. potentially available, you know. Toronto might not be willing to give up a first round pick for Sean Walker, but would they do a trade where Robertson is the centerpiece of a Sean Walker offer? I don't know. But those are the types of things that a creative GM should be looking at. I would hope that Danny Breer is considering those kind of options, but I don't think it's a necessity that they get another young forward back at this deadline. Speaking of a couple of young forwards, Charlie, you mentioned Morgan Frost there. Now, he and Joel Farabee combined for just one assist. Morgan Frost picked it up tonight. But I thought they had tremendous chemistry. We have seen this uh, with Joel Farabee with several line mates throughout the season. I know you've been very impressed with him. You tweeted about Farabee uh, during the game. But what did you see out of those two as a duo tonight? 
I thought Frost was great. I thought Frost from the start of this game had jump. He was moving through the ice well. I know he only gets the secondary assists, but I thought he had another really strong game. And I think we've talked about Joel Farabee a lot on these post games for good reason. Joel Farabee doesn't have bad games. Like he is reaching a point where every night you can expect him to be impactful. And I think that's really just what it boils down to is that I'm reaching the point with Joel Farabee that I'm surprised when he doesn't catch my attention in a game. I think he's taking a leap as a player. I've said it on the show multiple times. I think it's it's not being publicized enough nationally, the leap that Joel Farabee is taking as a player this year. And I'm really, really excited to see where this is going because every night he brings it. Uh, yeah, it's he's been one of the unsung heroes of this season. We know what Travis Konechny's done. Uh, we know what some of the defensemen have done in taking a step. Uh, but uh, Farabee has been a bigger part of this as anything. Like, I think Tippett gets a lot of that because he was like an unknown commodity before. And he's a top 10 pick. He, people knew his name. Farabee a little bit. I, I just feel like, yeah, like a little bit of an unsung hero this year. Uh, I got to talk to you about Risto because had your uh, had your appearance on the last post game gone longer, I was going to ask you, oh, do you really think he's sick? Or maybe they're going to trade him. But now uh, it turns oh, out boy. it looks like he was actually sick because he's back in the lineup tonight uh plays under 15 and a half minutes looks like he was yes yeah, sixth in terms of minutes in terms of minutes played uh, amongst the defensemen but we're starting to hear his name come up a little bit uh in terms of trade uh, rumors and listen it's all contingent on like how the hell can anyone make the money work because Probably no contender has five million dollars in cap space uh so we'll see how they can make that but do you think there's a possibility the Flyers end up trading Rasmus Ristolainen and keeping Sean Walker? In short, no. I don't <laughs> think that is that particular scenario is going to happen because we're, we're all basically piggybacking off of the conversation that Jeff yeah. Merrick and Elliot Freeman had on their yes. podcast. It was Jeff Merrick who theorized, might they bring back Sean Walker and trade Ristolainen? After that, I did some poking around. I do not get the sense... And I'm not saying that things couldn't change, but I'm not getting the sense that there has been any real progress on a Sean Walker extension. I still am of the opinion that the plan is to trade him. I haven't heard anything straight up from the Flyers about that, but I'm just just reading the tea leaves. It seems like he is likely to be moved for the best offer possible to clear up this log jam on defense. I think that's inevitably going to happen. Now, when we're talking about Risto, though, to me, the more interesting part about Risto's potential future came a couple days ago. I asked John Tortorella about Travis Sandlin, and I asked, basically, I wanted to dig into whether they thought that part of the reason why Sandheim has been struggling a bit, we brought it up on the show, is that he's been bouncing back and forth between the right and the left side since they've been going with, a, with seven defensemen, 11 forwards. And I asked him, I asked John Tortorella, what do you see Travis Sandheim as? And John Tortorella straight up said, we see him as a right side defenseman. Well, here's the thing. If Travis Sandheim is a right side defenseman, if that is his, you know, that's the role they envision him playing over the long term for this team, because he's under contract for quite a few more years. That's where he's going to be. And then you have Jamie Drysdale, who is a right-handed shooting defenseman. And you have Oliver Bont coming in the next couple of years. Mm -hmm. Suddenly, Rasmus Ristolainen does seem like he could be a bit expendable because either you're overpaying a third pair defenseman at $5.1 million a year, or even worse, if Bonk proves that he's ready, suddenly it's like, where does Risto even fit at all? So I don't I, I push against the the Walker Ristolainen framework that Jeff Merrick pointed out on his podcast, because I don't think that's the case. If Ristolainen gets moved, I don't think he's getting moved in order to sign Sean Walker. I think he's getting moved because they know that he is an overpaid third pair defenseman with the way this defense is shaking up for the future. And maybe if teams are interested in him, this might be the time to look around and see if a team might be willing to pay a lot for him. All right, Charlie, I think that's all we have for you. So without further ado, it's time for Charlie O'Connor's three stars of the game. Let's lead it off with star number three. Star number three, I am going to go with, and I think I went back and forth on this because he did have a mixed bag game. I think star number three, I'm going to go with Sean Gattari. I don't think he played well over the first two periods, but tie game, third period, he comes through. 
I can't put him any higher than third star because I think he was underwhelming the first two periods of this game. But he scores the game-winning goal in clutch fashion with a really, really nice deflection off what looked like a set play off a faceoff. He came through when he needed to come through. Can't put him any higher than third, but he had the big play. He had the play that won them this game. So I'm going to give Sean Couture my third star. Won the faceoff and got his ass to the net. What else can you ask of the guy on the play? He scores the goal. It's Charlie, star number three. Let's go to star number two. Star number two, I'm going to go with Cal Peterson. Cal Peterson wasn't amazing. I don't think he stole this game for the Flyers. The Flyers were the better team tonight. I think Cal Peterson only faced 19 shots, made 17 saves. So it wasn't a dominant performance. But Peterson did his job. He made the stops he had to stop. He kept the Flyers, I wouldn't say in this game because they led for a significant portion of it, but he did what he had to do. And maybe this is a little bit of a grading on a curve because I had low expectations for Cal Peterson going into this game, but they're justified low expectations. He struggled in the AHL this year. He's played poorly in the NHL the last few years. This could have been a disaster. There's a reason why we talked about on the show the idea of like, well, maybe they could toss a fifth round pick to somebody at the deadline and pick up a backup a backup goalie so that Sam Harrison doesn't have to play every single game. Instead, the roll in the dice on Peterson. I thought in this game, Peterson did exactly what a backup goalie has to do. He played well enough for the team to win. If the team plays well, the team played well. The Flyers won. I'm giving Cal Peterson my second star. Finally, first star. First star, I'm going to go with Scott Lawton. I just yeah. thought that he, he he came out in this game wanting to send a message. I, I think I'm going to write a story on this tomorrow. I think this game was low-key important for a lot of guys on the team and the team as a whole because I think John Tortorella kind of threw the gauntlet down to the team. Um, after the final two periods of, on Thursday's game, the team was not happy. John Tortorella was not happy. And John Tortorella kind of let the room dictate the uh, you know the response. He didn't go in there after Thursday's game and rip the team. He didn't show a ton of tape ripping everybody. He basically was like, you know what? I'm going to trust that these guys will respond the way they should and come out on Saturday and not carry over that poor play over the final two periods. They're going to come out and they're going to play well. And I thought Scott Lawton, more than anyone, led the way to make sure that response was strong. Look, I still think it makes sense for the Flyers to shop Scott Lawton, but tonight was a night where you can see the leadership value that he brings. You can see why he has a letter. You can see why he's a guy that drags people into the fight. I thought tonight he dragged people into the fight. He scores that big goal. The emotion after that goal was was there. I mean, you could tell he wanted that. He put, I, I think I tweeted out, he put a lot more than just muscle into that shot. That was yeah. that was a shot that, that he, he was feeling it. And I think the fact that he was feeling it allowed the rest of the team to feel it. And for that reason, I'm giving him my first start. I don't know if you saw it because it was on the uh, it was on the broadcast, and you're obviously up in the press box. But at, after first uh, during first intermission, they showed Scott Lawton's um, one timer statistic. He was 0 for 22 this season on one timers, <laughs> uh, and then of course goes one for one in the first period. So some might say he was due, uh, or maybe they found something. Uh, maybe they found a new role for Scott Lawton. Charlie, I know <laughs> I said I was done with you, but actually I have to ask you this: um, <laughs> the Union transfer tonight hosted the Ataris and MXPX, and okay. that led to us having no parking here at the studio. <laughs> I was losing my fucking mind. Brenna parked like two days away. Uh, what do you think about these bands? Because I believe they combined for two good songs between them. So I will say <laughs> I never was an MXPX fan. I, my my knowledge of them was when I was a kid, I would always mix them up with NOFX, uh, with NoFX. That, I always mixed up MXPX and yeah. NoFX. Okay. Um, the Ataris, look, Boys of Summer is a classic cover. Obviously, it wasn't their song. Love that cover. Remember them Remember them playing at the uh, the All-Star All game, game the year yeah. came out. Um, they have a few other <laughs> bangers, I would say, but I was never a huge Ataris person. I would give them more than two good songs between them, but for me, the good songs would all be on the Atari side. Yeah, uh, MXPX, Responsibility, Atari's, San Dimas High School Football Rules. That's it. Not giving them anything else. All right, Charlie, uh, that's it for us. I'll talk to you Monday. You'll be there home against uh, the Coyotes, so you'll be there. We will be yep. right here. We will talk you to, that, to you then, my friend. All right, sounds good. See Thanks, you, Charlie. Guys. All right, and that was Philadelphia's number one hockey beat reporter, Charlie O'Connor. Uh, and before we go any further, I mean, if you're not using Rocket Money yet, I don't know what I have to do to convince you. 
we're all spending way more than we want to on a number of things. I would say subscription services, whether it's you know, deliveries for God. No, I mean, I get all my toiletries delivered you know, whenever, like every couple of weeks, every couple of months. Obviously, all the streaming services. Game was on Hulu tonight. Uh, so we needed to sign into that to be able to watch it here at work. And maybe you lose track of these things. You're like, oh, it's a dollar here. It's a dollar there. I'm not really paying attention. It adds up. And that's where Rocket Money comes in. Rocket Money is a personal finance app that finds and cancels your unwanted subscriptions monitors your spending and helps lower your bills i can see all of my subscriptions in one place and if i see something i don't want i can cancel with just a tap i never have to get on the phone with customer service which is maybe the best part about this outside of you know the money saving mm-hmm. uh, and they'll even try to refund you for the last couple of months of wasted money and negotiate to lower your bills for you by up to 20 percent. all you have to do is take a picture of your bill and rocket money takes care of the rest Rocket Money has over 5 million users and has helped save its members an average of $720 a year with over 500 million in canceled subscriptions. So stop wasting money on things you don't use. Cancel your unwanted subscriptions by going to rocketmoney.com slash P-H-L-Y. That's rocketmoney.com slash P-H-L-Y. Rocketmoney.com slash P-H-L-Y. I don't know how much more we really have to get into Tonight, JP. So I guess the squirrel song is not cursed. I thought for a second it may have been cursed, but I, th- I guess it's gr- you see Gritty was playing it before the game. I did. I heard that they were <laughs> playing it, uh, and, and honestly, it's better than an, any uh, MXPX song. I will say I'm a little offended that Charlie used to mix up No Effects and MXP. I mean, that's I, I, granted tra- he's not. That's that's not his thing. If you want emo takes, Charlie's your guy. Uh, that's uh, listen. He'll uh, he's a he's one of my favorite hockey writers ever. He is a better music writer than he is a sports really? writer, okay. and he's an excellent sports writer. That's uh, good to but, but yeah, he's really good. But no, it's it, that shit just drove me nuts. You also said there's like a comedy show up the street. So there's that a comedy show. Maybe street, I'm unfairly bars. attributing this to the concert. Uh, but nothing drives me crazier than having to drive around looking for parking. And I got luckier than you two did, so I should probably stop complaining about this. And but we're Jersey boys, so parallel parking for us is not yeah, always I'm not the doing best. that. I really, no, like, my wife parallel parks. I just can't, I get too mad. I'm like, this is just asinine. Why? Why Why do I have to do this? And I'm just, I'm, I was never good at geometry. So, I, it's, yeah, I, I'm, I'm over all of that. But uh, <laughs> I don't even... What type is it? I think we're done, right? Oh, <laughs> I don't man. think there's too much more to talk about with the Flyers. Uh, but I am. It was a good I, I forgot to. I forgot to get out of Charlie. Um, uh, this is three in a row, a streak, so that guys. makes it what? It makes it a winning streak. After he messed up that, it's. I can't wait to talk uh, just sports movies this summer. Like that's going to be something. <laughs> See how many Charlie and I can both do word for word. All right, uh, but that's pretty much it for us. Another big win for the Flyers. Three they rounds. beat Seattle. That's three straight out of the break. The playoff push continues. We will keep track of how this uh, all unfolds as it leads up to the March 8th trade deadline. And hopefully the final game of the season is not in mid-April. Hopefully it's you know, maybe maybe around Memorial Day. Yeah. That would be nice. Uh, but we will, we will be back uh, live for the Monday post game. We'll get... The schedule out to you after that, and uh, I don't know. I assume like Tuesday, Wednesday, regular live shows. We'll see. We'll see how it all unfolds. All right, for uh, for JP Zapata, for Charlie O'Connor, my name is Bill Matz. Thank you all for listening. Thank you for hanging out. If you haven't already, follow us everywhere, right here on YouTube, on Twitter. Subscribe to the podcast, all that good stuff. Uh, maybe become an, a diehard, diehard member at allphly.com. Buy some hey. merch at Philly, uh, phlylocker.com. I know I'm just throwing all the things at you. I'm just filling time now. Uh, that's it for us. My name's Bill Matz. Have a great Saturday night, Philly. See you guys. We all silly like the mayor. 